Hold on, I need to move stuff aside so I can move my notes one page at a time and go rapidly through them. Look at this stack of notes. This is chapter one. Chapter one? Just as long as chapter one. Pretty Kelly, nice. didn't you have about nine pages the first time we had our first I podcast? I had nine pages per individual page of the book, I feel. <laughs> That's why now I have to read it all through and just tap the important parts and then go back and like take notes off my tabbed pages because if I was taking notes as I read I would just write every single word down and then my thoughts on every single word just rewrite the book plus write another one yeah plus my opinion <laughs> <laughs> they let's get ready to rumble pew 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 pew, pew. Wah, wah. smoke machines <laughs> lasers zoo, zoo, zoo. Welcome to Dog Ear Discourse, a nerdy little double date where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Every month we're pulling a new and exciting book from our shelf. We've broken them down so you can buddy read with us or just hang out while we discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading A Face Like Glass by Francis Harding. Chris, can you give us the 60 second recap of where we are? I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, do we have a timer? Timer being pulled up and ready. Give me a countdown. Three, two, one, go. In the underground city of Caverna, Man Master Cheese Maker Grandable finds a child in a vat of Neverfell Way. He then names her Neverfell and adopts her. Seven years later, she is getting in trouble and she... Lewis carols, carols her way out into the city and finds herself amongst nobles. At that point, she's uh, taken to a face smith who is interviewing putty girls. Uh, at that point, uh, we find out that they can't make faces, which is kind of cool. Um, but she can, as, as she is unmasked and then imprisoned. After her first assassination attempt... Um, she gets adopted by a winemaker who can make magical wine. And then um, she's taken to a ball, at which point she knocks over some wine uh, and then gets bought by the grand dude who then... Uh, Stop. It is just a melding of decadence in this glass. So the first drink for a face like glass is called Court Decadence. It is actually a play on the Colombian hot chocolate, which is dark chocolate, sugar, and milk poured over soft white cheese. In our case, we used mozzarella with Bailey's Irish whiskey and a sprinkling of powdered cheese, the type that you would put on mac and cheese on the very top. You should try this. I know what you're thinking, and that sounds super weird. It is. It is really delicious also. It is a snack, it is a delicious beverage, and it pairs really nicely with a face like glass. So getting into the book, like Chris was saying, kind of the first thing that happens is Grandable, the cheesemonger, he's curmudgeon -y, he's very strict and is set in his ways. He's been kind of separated from the whole world for kind of a long time, and all he knows now is his cheeses and the way he likes things done, and somebody is stealing his cheeses. And it turns out to be this cute little girl who fell into his vat of never fell away, which would be terrifying, but not a terrible way to go. During one of our trips to Wisconsin, I saw how cheese curds are made and how they're scooped out of a vat. And all I kept thinking was that video that I watched and just drowning in that. Oh. That would not be a fun way no. to go. No, it would not. So Grandable saves this child. He sees that... She has the ability to have full facial expressions. And he's super scared, really shocked, because all of the people of Caverna have to learn painfully and slowly facial expressions one at a time. And they are born without any. Yeah, it, it describes it as a, um, they have all the muscles. It's just a link is not there in their learning so something doesn't connect and they have to manually learn how to make the faces yeah I like the point brought up that a child would mimic the expressions of whoever it was that they were looking at mm -hmm. mother father whatever and in caverna like you said that they just stared back at a face and made none of their own right 
It's like they can recognize faces, but they have no idea how to make them. And, and this isn't revealed until way later. He just looks at her face and puts a mask on her. Yeah, don't, don't show that to anybody. But then he adopts her. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, he watches over her. Needs a slave. Needs a slave. He's also alone. Needs someone to trust. So then seven years later, the book jumps seven years at that point. So it goes from five to 12. So she's 12 years old at this point, And she's a cheese apprentice with a really good nose. Kind of a tinkerer also. She likes to invent stuff on her free time and try to make her job, her slaving a little bit easier. It starts off describing that and then it like abandons that idea for a long time and then brings it back later on um, in the book. Yeah, I don't think that he actually sees it as slavery. I think that he sees himself as a father figure. Grandable keeps her out of sight and he is not trusting of anybody at all. And so he has her wear this mask that covers her entire face and only has two little pinholes in the eyes so that she can see out of it um, when people are over. She doesn't have to wear it all the time. And she asks him why she has to wear this mask. And he said gruffly, because he doesn't have a lot of emotions, he only has like a couple facial expressions because he never uses anything else, that she has to wear it for the same reason a wound wears a scab. She thinks she's disfigured. Yeah, she thinks she's hideous. The seven years that she's living with Grandable, she thinks she has to hide from society because she is hideous, something wrong with her face, and there's no reflections, there's like nothing that she can see what she looks like. For that quote that he said to her, I think what he really meant was for protection. That's what I wrote. Oh, that's that a good take on because that. Because a scab does protect a wound. Yeah, and I think that was actually my view of it as well. So she is a cheese apprentice slash slave and then gets visited by a face smith, Madame Appeline, Vesperta Appeline. Yeah, so face smiths in this world are people who make expressions and teach them to other people. So this is someone who can figure out what an emotion sh should be conveyed on the face. And then they teach people how to make that face. And everybody has to pay for each individual expression. So like the poor people only have two or three different facial expressions that they can make. Whereas the rich people have like one for every reaction possible. Yeah. And then they have to figure out how to switch between them really rapidly and stuff like that. Somebody who was like a lowly manual labor only really needed to express a few, maybe a grimace here and there or and then the farther along you got in society, the more faces, the more subtlety you needed for those reactions of your rich, wonderful life. Yeah, and it kind of calls back to the commentary on the haves versus the have-nots, right? Um, I feel like there's a lot of that in this book. Madame Appeline, the face smith, comes and visits. She wants something. When Madame Appeline comes and she ends up talking to Neverfell a little bit and telling her that she has a friend. If she ever needs anybody to get a message to her, she tells her kind of where she's located. And they kind of have like a little moment where Neverfell feels a good connection with her. But when she is leaving, she gives Neverfell a very tragic look where Neverfell had the feeling of just starting to cry and like running up and like hugging her. And it was such a emotional facial expression that Neverfell was convinced that Madame Appeline had to have felt that way in order to be able to convey that facial expression. So she already she wants to help her really bad because she feels bad. She's like, oh, there's something that had happened to her and that's why she can make this tragic face. And she's like, why did you give her the cheese? Why aren't you going to help out that lady? And he says, pull on a thread and you pull on the whole web and then out um, the spiders and I kind of took that as if you if he dealt with one thread of the court that he would have to deal with many others and that was one of the reasons why he hid himself in the tunnels so after um never fell tattles on herself that she sent out the piece of cheese to her he then goes into this like exposition of his backstory on what he used to be involved that's why he hid out in the tunnels now and does his business away from everybody because he doesn't want to be caught up in all the drama 
at the time and up till this point, I feel like what he mostly meant was if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want some milk. So if you help out Madam Appleine, who else is going to want favors? So that's just going to cause this snowball effect. And opening the door to somebody to basically see your quarters in the favor aspect means that other people will find ways in. So when he says, like, out come the spiders, I think that he meant like a play on words of the spies will come. Yeah, and it did explain later on that he did evade many assassination attempts after he decided to withdraw from court. There was a bunch of them. And so he was like, yeah, they're going to just come out and try and kill me again. He's like, I don't want anything to do with court. And it was like a John Wick thing where they're like, okay, well, we're going to kill you unless you do these things. And he's like, eh, how about not? Oh, thanks. Yeah, you stay neutral long enough that everyone figures out that you're neither going to help their enemy or he's going to be an issue for you or your cause. So I think at some point it's, uh, again, back to the web thing where any any movement on that web and, you know, each strand represents some some interest that is other than his, no matter where it is, it's going to bring a spider from somewhere. She has given this cheese to a delivery boy for Madden Appleine, told Grandabelle about it. He freaks out, tells her about how lethal court is, and she wants to fix it. But he also tasks her with a lot of miscellaneous tasks, including milking a rabbit. And that's the point at which she has to chase down the rabbit because the rabbit does not want to be milked. And she runs from her. And she goes chasing after the rabbit, and the rabbit is squirrely. And just like Lewis Carroll, she follows the rabbit through a hole in the wall, which then leads her to the next section of her life, which is outside of Grandibal's confinement. So she runs into three characters almost immediately. Zool, Borkus, and Marden, who they barely even name Marden. Zool and Borkus are sitting there plotting how they can go against Madame Appeline. They need to get her some wine. And this wine is going to wipe her memory a little bit. And so when Neverfell comes popping out of the wall, they notice her and they're immediately afraid of her because she's just some random stranger in the dark. Once they're convinced that she is not going to harm them, immediately Zoel turns into, oh, maybe we can use this new stranger. And they convince her to join them and be their best friend and pose as somebody who's trying to audition to be one of the face smiths apprentices and slip her that wine which is actually pretty convenient for Neverfell as well because she wants to get in there and meet Madame Appleline and steal the cheese back also because she feels a little guilty about that I felt like Zoelle throughout this whole book kind of reminded me of Sansa Stark where she is very put together and is very good at lying and is very good at playing the game I don't know she just gives me like these vibes of danger every time I read about her. I don't know if you guys got that same vibe. Oh yeah, she's totally not trustworthy whatsoever. And she's just, she's very quick to turn any situation into her advantage. It's a valuable skill. She is a nobility, so it makes sense that she has to learn some of this uh, social engineering. But she definitely jumps right on the opportunity to take this random stranger, never fell, and use her for her own purposes and keep herself out of any immediate danger by not even being really involved. Also, Neverfell is just so glad that somebody is giving her a plan because she is terrified still because this is all very new to her. So she goes in and auditions and they take her into this, basically a paradise. It it feels like above ground. But as part of this audition, she ends up with her mask off of her face. And the second the mask falls off of her face, everybody's drops their own faces that they've been performing and just lose their absolute minds. They think she's a demon. That was uh, one of the parts that I just, uh, I could not stop laughing thinking of these, like the putty girls and they're just melted faces of just <laughs> having a, like slurring speech and can't talk because their their faces are supposed to be so pliable 
The putty so, girls are the apprentices of the face. Man. Yeah, I'm like, how would you know if one of these, like, the what is the the signs of a stroke? Like you, <laughs> you'd be like, oh wow, you're such great work, and you're like, no, I I I need a doctor. I think <laughs> they're so afraid of the faces that she's making because what ends up happening is her face moves when she feels things, which is not like anybody else in this world. Kind of like how you and I would make a face when we react. I'm making faces as I'm talking right now. This is not acceptable in Caverna. So the inquiry comes and takes her away and puts her in a cage over a lake. I, I, I think she's more magical than just making faces based on her reaction. Because when I'm looking at you and I'm seeing your faces, I can't read your mind. When I'm looking at Juan, I can't read his mind. He's looking confused at me. I can see he's confused, <laughs> but I can't read his mind. I can't read his thoughts. And when someone from Caverna sees her, not only can they understand what she's feeling, but they can actually read her mind. She actually re specifically references it when she's given a mirror um, in the cage. She looks at herself and she says, as I'm seeing myself, I can read my thoughts as they're being echoed in my head mm -hmm. that I need to tell Grandable. Is that because she's young? Like she's 12? Do I don't think that, so. Do I think just... that this is something, I think this okay. is something unusual. I think it's beyond just making faces. I think it's to the point of it's so transparent what she's thinking that she cannot lie, but she also like truths are being told through her face. Mm. I didn't read it that way. I read it more of she had a very expressive face and she just never learned to control her emotions because she didn't even know that she was expressing them in the first place. And so because everybody else is just basically a blank slate, even one little like emotion showing, like raising your eyebrows in surprise, that that doesn't happen. So of course they would see that she's surprised in a way that, Nobody else projects. Right. Mm. But I can see someone surprised without seeing the visceral reaction of, I feel your pain. They recoiled and they dropped down and started crying and also recoiled with pain when she was feeling pain. Yeah. Cause they also uh, feel her emotions too. And they're like overwhelmed. Right. And so like you can put a, you can put a face on like the face smiths do, but she projects this emotion into people that crushes them and i'm wondering if that's beyond the natural and might have something to do with where she's at there are magical things in this world she gets taken away from the audition at madame appeline's she realizes that everybody is freaking out and they like think she's a demon except for madame appeline she can hear her say impossible instead of like ew get the thing away from me like she that's the words that she uses so she does kind of file that away for later and she's like that's interesting um and then while she's in the cage at the inquiry inquiry i love this scene because they describe it as she's hanging in an onion shaped cage of cast iron over this canal and if they misbehave they dunk the cage in the canal water and there ends up being an assassination attempt on her. Her first one. Her Baby's first assassination attempt. <laughs> get a nice little scrapbook. <laughs> get, get a and button. this is when the shot rang out. She's probably oh, older than most that. of the first timers. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Because she has a very delicate cheese master nose, um, she can smell somebody wearing a capital P perfume, which means that it is a special perfume that makes you think thoughts think things that can it was cause the things. trusting yeah it's, yeah it's like a, it was the trust blend yeah and trust blend she kind of knows how to deal with this a little bit she gets dunked into the canal and the inquiry rush in and they save her because they're like what the hell like who did that did you see who tried to kill you and she's like no i was busy drowning <laughs> maximum comes and talks to her and basically tells her that if she doesn't confess and take full responsibility, they will kill Grandable. Dude, this part made my hands sweat. I'm like, you got to get yourself a lawyer. Do not talk to anybody. <laughs> yeah. You have the right to remain silent. <laughs> and he would have just been like, dunk. Yeah. 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 Also, she's 12. There's no way she could afford a lawyer. 
Not in this city. No. <laughs> also, you couldn't even trust the lawyer in this city because he's got his own... He's got his own agenda that he's going to be playing at. Yeah. No, you should totally confess to this crime. I mean, that crime that somebody else committed that I totally didn't do. Exactly. I'll get you a good deal, kid. So she winds up uh, totally confessing to uh, the Grand Stewart and basically taking full responsibility for her being alive. Because the main thing is she's an outsider. They all see her as an outsider. And that in and of itself is a crime. And then everybody associated with her is a crime. And she smells very much of cheese. And so they immediately know it's grandable. So she has to take full responsibility and then winemaker buys her. And it was interesting that he mentioned to make sure that anybody you ran into was just, you know, inconsequential that you take responsibility even for getting other people involved. Yeah. Especially Zuel. We find out later that Zuel is Maxim's, Great, 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 great grandniece. Because he's very, very, very old. Because he's rich. So he takes Neverfell to his grand mansion, gives her that luxurious life. They're like super bougie. Their grapes come from the overground. Apparently, nobody from this family has actually been to the overground, but all their wine grapes. Yeah, it's come illegal from. to leave. Yeah, because they want to keep the craftsmen's secrets secret from the overground establishments Same, yeah they're so they protecting don't, their exports right, right so they don't allow any of the grandmasters to leave the caverna they don't allow anybody but especially not the masters this reminds me a lot of um olden time europe where if you had a master glass maker for example glass is the one i'm thinking of and they can make clear glass you keep them and so you put them on this tiny island in the middle of the river and if they try to cross you execute them actually happened if i can't have glassware nobody can if we can't have you no one can yeah. is the idea yeah a certain galileo perhaps i, I forget when it was i think it was in yeah. Italy somewhere he was uh spying on other people uh because he heard of the spyglass so he's like mm, before that merchant can get here i will create my own so they but never fell on the fast track to go to her first banquet because she's an oddity and and so they want to show off that they have her as part of their family, we'll say, but really property. Um, and so their plan is to show her off at a banquet coming up the next day, which Zuel is really upset by. Because people what? train for years to go to banquets. Yeah, she keeps it together as best she can, but she's been training her whole life to go to her first banquet, which is going to be the same banquet as Never Fell. And she has to train never fell. It's like training your replacement practically is the vibe that I got from it. Yeah, she wanted the spotlight for herself for a little bit. Yeah. And that was just like yanked away from her because of cheese smell. Yeah. <laughs> Which would be really annoying. Cheese girl. I do feel bad for her for that because she takes a lot of pride in her own etiquette and way of carrying herself. And now she's about to sit, play second fiddle to some random stranger that she stumbled upon a week ago. And we find out that the banquets are... Super lethal. One of the pastimes, apparently, of all the rich people is assassinating other rich people. <laughs> There's apparently 82 ways to die at a banquet, and you have to be prepared for every one of them, mm -hmm. including death by delicacy. Among all the different etiquette rules she has to learn, of which there are many, she also is just like loaded up with ring after ring after ring of different antidotes and has to memorize what antidote goes to what. And how much time you have to wait between getting poisoned and taking the antidote and all this stuff. I just love the the image of all of these people having, at some point during this thing, they're taking antidotes, kind of foaming at the mouth and pretending like somebody didn't just try to kill them. Just nonchalantly. One guy literally falls to his face at the table and everyone's like, ha ha. Sucks to be him. And his friends are like, pick him up and just take him they off. Just they just quietly yeah. get rid of him. He's and dead. everyone's like, well, he should have paid more attention. His own fault. So this banquet's going off in full swing, and then people start dying. And never fell is freaking out about that. But they do talk about all of these delicacies where they start explaining a little bit more about the true cheeses and wines and the jellies was one of them. Um, where they have magical properties and the reason why they're created is for the Grand Steward because he is so very bored. He, and old. 
he old and bored. He's old and the oldness made him bored. And so he's looking for anything that like gives a little color to his life, right? Only so, like, on his left eye days. He sees only in grays and things like that until he, you know, sees something that catches his eye and he sees it in color for a little while and then everything goes gray again. And he and and they start describing these cheeses and uh, jellies and things like that, where the jellies have live birds in them, and then you taste a little bit of them, and you can hear their song while you're eating. And then one of them will stab you in the neck and kill you. But you can only hear the song if you eat the jelly because they are silent. Yeah, the jelly gets infused with song, like a flavor you can hear. Are these guys French? <laughs> I think one of the parts that really stood out to me was when a person was pouring the wine, a rogue droplet hits the table and Neverfell was told that the smallest mistake is worth more than a servant's life. And she didn't want that servant to die. She'd never seen him before. She never had talked to him. She just knew that he was terrified. So she knocked over the wine. What a waste. So, he, well, like he might die. He spilled a little drop. So she's like, Wine everywhere. This is the second time that she's just acted on her own will, and it has had very dire consequences that she does not think about beforehand. It was like record, record screech, like, <laughs> I know. Everybody's eyes just, whoosh. what the heck just happened? Like, no way did that just happen. Yeah, because that's like a lethal move. Like, your entire family's about to die. Like, they're going to execute you. They're going to execute your whole family because this is a mistake. Nobody saw it as... A mistake. They saw it as somebody told her to do that intentionally, and she's working for somebody else. And like, the, what's the the hidden motives behind this action? Yeah. So Maxim turns to her, and he like knows that his fate is sealed, and he's like, "You're going home right now." GTFO. And so she leaves. And the second she leaves, a new character pops onto the scene: the kleptomancer. Pew, 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 pew. This was the point in time when I started rooting literally for everyone else. I'm like, I'm the, I throw her in the volcano. <laughs> <laughs> One more of these. Yeah. So this was supposed to be the time where the cheesemongers big salute to the court. The, the 141 minute flipping cheese. Yeah. That had to be this brushed with rabbit's Steph milk. Deck Balter yeah. Sturton was supposed to come out on this elaborate display and they pop open the top. And there's a little fat man standing on the platter and the cheese is gone. Yeah. Now he's not just like he's armored and everything. He's got this whole metal suit on and it looks like a freaking like old timey <laughs> diver. And he's just like pops up like hey, and just decides to run for it and he jumps, waddles away. He jumps into the uh, in, yeah. into the lagoon and just starts swimming away. And they're like, what the heck? Now, never fell. Had already bounced by this point so she didn't see this oh she missed it she would have loved it she would have laughed her ass off. and then they would have killed her but <laughs> but that, that, that was probably one of my favorite things like you have this giant five foot wide dish with a big silver dome and you just pop up and you just <laughs> it's great how do you even steal so this cheese is supposed to be like enormous you she couldn't flip it on her own like this was a two-man job to flip this cheese how do you get rid of this cheese well, they did. They did mention him earlier in passing, saying that he stole a water wheel at one point. So I think that he can steal whatever he wants. Like the Banksy of thievery. <laughs> <laughs> so this then brings us back to the Childersons Manor, in which Neverfell is panicking. She's like, uh "Oh, what's going to happen?" And so she went and hid in a closet because she knows better. She's like, "Where am I safe? Not here." And so she went and hid in a closet. And they all come home and are making a ruckus. But Maxim's not with them. And the whole family is just like, oh, it's that little brat's fault. And they were not talking about Neverfell. They were talking about Zuella. Why? She did nothing wrong at this point. But they were about to throw her right under the bus and let her take all the damage for this whole situation of embarrassing them in public. And so, like, in this chaos, Neverfell goes up, grabs Zuel, and is like, we need to bounce now. And sh they, like, run. And they, they get the heck out of there. Somewhere along the line, Erstwhile comes and helps them find, a, like, an, another way to safety. As they're running by? Because he, yeah. he was standing, like, right outside. And so he looks upon her face and is like, I can tell you hate him just by having to talk about him. 
you're just like, oh, I'm annoyed that I even have to talk about him. He, <laughs> he's the most honest person in this book, except for Neverfell. He looks at her face and he's like almost insulted that she is able to have all these different looks and opinions. Like he feels practically emasculated by the fact of her face. It's really annoying. And well, I think it, I think that was because like, he thought he had the upper hand when she had the upper hand the whole time in his mind and it all shifts. And then he realizes she's just a ignorant little girl and she needs to learn real fast. And he basically tells her everyone is lying to you all the time, including me, <laughs> including me. I am lying to you. Like, not right now, though, but he's I have like, been in the past. Yeah, and then suddenly it's like, wait, you're lying? He's like, yeah. wait. and then it's the, you realize that, yes, but there are also different types of lies. I, for example, was just, uh, you know. Embellishing. Uh, yeah, I was uh, putting a little extra spice on my stories, and but these people's lies are uh, to get you killed. Yeah. And. Yeah, well, he tells her about the clep kleptomancer coming and stealing the cheese, and he's like. Yeah, he found a way to steal it, but nobody blames you. That would be like blaming a hat or a stick. Like, just well, I mean, he. I like the. I way mean, he put it. The, I think the. <laughs> I think the way he put it is very honest. I think he is the most honest person that has interacted with her. Even though he lied the most, he was blatant about it, and it didn't matter how much he was hurting her. He was like, "You have to understand, everyone's lying to you." She took it well, though. Like she was like, "Okay." But I'm still going to do me. I'm still going to do what I want. Right. And his thing was like when he was running off, like that's when he actually showed his emotion. He's like, yeah, he actually cares for her. And I think that was I think that was a good thing. And then should they all go and turn themselves in? Right. Ta -da! Ta -da! They, <laughs> they go to the they go to the Grand Stewart and be like, I did it on purpose. You can blame me. I'm not going to tell you why. Oops. Oops. I did it again. Oh. Nobody coerced me. I did it of my own volition. And the Grand Steward's like, huh. And that's when she gets the audience with him. Set the stage. You got three Inquisitors lined up at, at a table with like very little light. And then you have Grand Steward who's on this big throne above everybody. Who she thinks is a statue because he does not move. He's not moving at all. And then they start asking her a lot of questions. And then give her a box. What's in the box? Grand Stewart is watching her reactions while she's opening all these boxes. And finally, after he runs out of boxes, he's like, I think this is legit. I cannot understand how anyone could prepare this number of learned faces. He's thinking of like actual citizens of Caverna. And so he realizes that she is an outsider only at that point. Like he believes that only after she goes through and has all these traumatic experiences where he actually starts to feel scared himself a little bit. Like he can kind of feel feelings through her expressions and reactions. And so then he wants to keep her near him because it's like this shiny new toy that just gave him vitality. He can see the world through her eyes. I took that to be like, you know how a face like glass. No, I was thinking like, like a glass window, maybe a window into the soul. Um, I was thinking more like when you see the perspective of a child, like when, when a little kid sees, um, fireworks for the first time or, um, Christmas lights and they're like, oh, and they got that big wide eyed, you see gifts of that all the time. I think that that's what he was doing was he was seeing that and actually feeling something for the first time in centuries i thought he was looking at her like oh i could always send her in first like she was never gonna be, like yeah you go around the corner first kid she's gonna be okay <laughs> all right well and that's kind of exactly what he did because he assigned yeah. her to be one of his new taste testers <laughs> he's like you you try first <laughs> he had a favored food tester that got assassinated three days prior to this whole thing happening and it just so happens that he makes her his newest or newest food taster. And then he calls upon her the very next day to go out and try to figure out this kleptomancer situation on 
who where his missing gift of cheese is. Now, and he you, takes her. She hasn't had any training on this. At all. Right? So, so she's getting she's getting all these things. She's like, okay, you need to go to a banquet without training. You need to be a food taster without training. The only thing she's trained on how to do is make cheese. <laughs> also, 12. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's right. So uh, he takes her along and they go and they go investigate. Actually, they don't even do really anything. They just go over to the inquiry and um, the main inquirer chick is like, Here's the lowdown. Here's what really happened. We learned some more information. Basically, the kleptomancer dug a hole above where the cheese was being held in the cavern, pushed the pieces of cheese up into the hole and saved them and, and returned at a later date to pick the cheese up. And this is where I found it really funny because it was like, um, never feels like, I th- well, he must know something about cheeses because, um, and, and they're like, why? Because he had to poke them with golden pins. Why would he need to do that? Well, you would have heard the explosions. Yeah. <laughs> so this 12-year-old pretty much makes some uh, good decisions. <laughs> she shares her opinion on what she thinks all these other people that are higher qualified to do this. And they listen to her. The grand... Like, wait, she's actually making good points. Right. And I think that's actually a good thing. Like, that's a good point because, like, maybe the nobody talks their mind around the Grand Steward because they're going to get killed. And she's just like, meh, I've been close to death so many times a day. Eh, I know. I viewed this as another highly unlikely info dump. And she gets these with all of her owners, pretty much. When Grandable sits down and drinks his weird alcoholic beverage that he drinks and, and explains to her his whole backstory and why things are the way they are and why he's pissed off at her. He doesn't ever say that many words. And for him to just kick his feet up and be like, here's my whole life story. I just felt like it was very unlike his character. And the same thing happened with Maxim Childerson, where the next day of her being in his care, he shows her all of his like secret pictures of all of where his vineyards are and then he immediately wants to recover her memories he wants to help her and he tells her pretty much his life story also the next day that she arrives there and also this happens with the very next day that she arrives at the grand steward he just takes her as a parrot on his shoulder and listens to everything she says even though she's a 12 year old child and is telling her all these things he doesn't speak ever he just like gestures and then people are like oh he meets us and they like do things for him but he's like having full-on conversations with her and again i just felt like it's great for us readers because there's a lot going on in the first half of this book but i don't like it at the same time because these characters aren't like that i was kind of telling chris about this as we were discussing before getting to the podcast but I felt like as I was reading this, I would start to get these little light bulbs were turning on like, oh, 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 I'm connecting these dots. Okay. Okay. So, so if this happened seven years ago and this happened seven years ago and these other coincidental things happened all at the same time, maybe this is going to happen. And then the next page after I would make that like... I'm a genius moment. They would have a long exposition basically saying exactly what I just found out. Yeah. (sighs) Which I get because this book is not aimed towards 35 year olds. It's aimed for like young adults. So I kind of get it. If you're 15 years old, you maybe you haven't read quite as much as all of us have. And you don't know how to make those connections. Maybe also, I am paying a lot more attention to reading this book because we have this podcast. Right. So when I first started reading the book, I didn't understand why her name was never found. <laughs> I missed that whole thing. <laughs> you know, I read really quickly and I don't really pick up all the details. And so I think I read like the first or second chapter and then I ended up like, oh, I need to take notes and stuff. So we're going to talk <laughs> about this. So I should probably. And so I oh, ended yeah, up the podcast. Yeah. Like I read it. mean by it? <laughs> They were referring to her. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I would have 
pieced those, oh, this is seven years ago. This happened at seven years ago. This happened at seven years ago. If I wasn't like hyper aware of everything because we're talking about it with the podcast, I don't know. Makes you critically read a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And I agree with you that the, the info dumps that they have, the world building info dumps are really neat from our perspective, but very unrealistic. Like have a different character say that, like the maid or somebody else who's helping her, not the grand steward. Right. Or, you know, important people who just would not have the time to sit all day long and explain the world to the child. I think it brings it back to the expression thing, though. I, I believe her expressions do more than just cause fear into people. Because, like, if she's expressing curiosity, they want to explain. Like, when she had questions on the brain, the grand steward was like, fine, ask your questions. Like, he got m visibly mad, but he then willingly gave out all these answers Maybe her face is like, give me more, give me more, give me more. And they're like, okay, sure. You know, when like kind of exactly what you were just saying about the kids watching fireworks and how they get so excited and you kind of just want to keep that excitement going. So you, I don't know. I act a little different around a kid that's excited than a kid that's kind of bored where I'm like, what can I do to keep this going? Like, yeah. what else do you want to play with? Like, let's do this. <laughs> and they're. That's what she is to them. Nobody else makes expression. So every face she makes is novel and exciting and interesting. And now they have that ability to bring excitement on others. Right. Yeah. So they can be the cause of her making another face just by saying something. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the more you say, like, maybe that builds up good emotion inside of them. Because, like, if you see somebody get excited about something, you're going to feel nice. She might be bringing endorphins to this place in a long time. So they go to the cabinet of curiosities after talking to the cartographer for a second. The grand steward comes up with this awesome plan to catch the kleptomancer. And that is to challenge him to put out a, a general challenge to the public, but obviously to the kleptomancer to get the newest oddity in his curiosity shop, which is uh, basically a stuffed creature. It is kind of like a giraffe, but they call it a camel leopard. Camel leopard. Leop yeah. camel leopard. That's right. Okay. So yeah, they have some weird names for stuff. I honestly thought when I heard that, that it was basically just some guy that came by and he was like, oh, you guys want to buy something really cool? And it was just the worst taxidermy, just this guy that put like <laughs> remnants of animals together. And he's like, oh, check out this animal we just found. So the Grand Stewart looks at this camel leopard. And sees Neverfall, like, galloping around it, being so excited about seeing this thing. And asking a million and ten questions about where it came from and its, like, habitat and all sorts of things. He says, he challenges the thief to steal the latest and greatest curiosity to come into the Grand Steward's possession. And that's, like, the wording that he uses for this challenge for the thief. And immediately, I thought, because of the wording... In his possession, not in the cabinet of curiosities. I thought, like, right away, I was like, Neverfell is going to get kidnapped. Yep. 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 Like, that was, like, plain as day. Yeah. Yeah. I did not think that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay. when it happened, it's like, oh, smart. Yeah. Funny. So after the uh, cabinet of curiosities, they go back to the palace. Now, Neverfell hasn't really spent a lot of time with the tasters and she gets back there and realizes that it's an opium den. Like they are straight up stoned oh, yeah. out of their mind the whole time. Probably yeah, they're pumping perfume, capital P perfume, which is as we were talking about before the basically drugs <laughs> into the, into the sleeping areas. And the it's what perfume areas. wants to be. Yeah. And that's how they try to sell it to you in the commercials. They're like this is going to make you Zen. Oh, everyone and, will want you. <laughs> and so she wants to go exploring. Of course. She's been cooped up with all these strangers for X amount of time. So she just kind of goes out into the world. Yeah, I love how everyone's like, why? You, you shouldn't <laughs> do that. You, underst you understand that this is as good as it gets around here. Yeah. You can be stoned out of your mind right here. Why do you need to go out there? She's like, because there's stuff out there I haven't seen yet. What's this? What's, What's this? this? A magical. monkey over there. <laughs> a camel leopard. <laughs> camel leopard here. She is looking for Madame Appeline so she can explain herself. 
And so she just sets out into the world. She just goes out into the palace. Yep. She's like, peace. She encounters the face. Yes. Oh, those those hags were freaking creepy. They reminded me of the crones from The Witcher 3. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. She gets guided to these two face myths named Snia and Simpria. They basically reveal to Neverfell that nobody likes Madame Appleine. They think she's a, a hack who had like a, basically a one-trick pony who came in, stole everybody's thunder, and is now riding the glory from seven years ago. And they're like, but you should tell us all about what what your story is. Like, how can you make all those faces? And as they're kind of just like having a discussion, they're getting like kind of creepy and close to her and are like watching her face face. really closely. They're trying to sketch all of her emotions. They get like frustrated, her facial expressions. They get frustrated because her expressions are moving so quickly that they can't capture it. So they're like, what if we pinned her to a ball? Yeah, like a butterfly. Just, just. Then we can ex- then we can really examine how everything works. She's okay. like, and then she dawns on her that they want to kill her, or at least want her dead. They want her face. Sign this paper, and when you die, we have the right to take your head. We just need your head. That's it. Right, and that's creepy. <laughs> so she <laughs> books it, and she is like, in the most cinematic way possible. She's like jumping over tables and pushing things off to the side and making a huge mess. Uh, And she uh, gets the heck out of Dodge. And she gets back to her little dormitory with the rest of the food tasters, which actually she's living in the lap of luxury again because she gets a bed with the four super tall posts with the canopy. And so she gets to just like monkey her way up and sleep in the canopy. And then she gets nice and comfy and falls asleep, which is a perfect timing on her part because... Right as she, like, snugs up, she gets her second assassination attempt. They start using First the worst, worms. second the best. Yeah, these really creepy worms. This they're guy, like fluffy worms. They're clicky worms. Clicky, he, fluffy worms. And they're, I can't get a grasp in my mind of how big they are because he puts them through the keyhole of the door and they scuttle around and then they're climbing up the bed. So this assassin comes in and... All of a sudden, the lamps start exploding into darkness, and they just basically blows up all the lamps. And in the darkness, he can move, and he guides his way through the palace. Now, he's in the palace. Like, he could kill the steward if he wanted to, but instead he's going after Neverfell. And all the guards and everything are all over guarding the leopard doodle or whatever it's called, the big um, giant thing that is the challenge. and. The assassin goes to try and kill Neverfell and puts these worms through the little keyhole. Yeah, gross. and they squirm towards her, and then they get to the bed, and they're all confused, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious because they're like little yeah. worms. How do they know? But she is awakened by them, like moving on the bed and like making their weird little chewy noises, and so she tries to sneak out of the room, and they notice her and start chasing her down. She can't see anything because it's dark. So all of a sudden she trips over something, which is perfect timing because then whoosh, like the assassin tried to slice her. Yeah. The assassin was trying to like basically red rover her as she was going. And like as she was running out the door, he was going to get her. But she trips right at the perfect moment. And he cuts right at where her neck would have been and instead gets his knife jammed into the door frame and gets stuck. So she bounces. <laughs> And then while she's running away and the, the assassin starts trying to attack her, the assassin gets attacked. Good. Karma. Yep. And the assassin promptly gets killed by an armored person. A little tubby armored dude. Very similar to the banquet. <laughs> and now the kleptomancer is back and steals her. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. He knew that if he knew the plan that other people would figure out what the plan was. But if he doesn't even know the plan, then how can someone predict him? And so he had to make himself forget the plan. So he doesn't even know really why he's doing it, but he knows that there's a reason. 
And if he gets captured, he has literally no way of revealing the plan in the first place. It is a very dangerous way of operating. <laughs> yeah, what are the odds that you look at this note and you're like, somebody's trying to fool me. Turns yeah. out it was me fooling me. <laughs> I'll never let me pull one over on me. <laughs> it, it's another theme that they have in this book, which is trust. And nobody can trust anybody. Even the Grand Stewart was like, I can't even trust myself. My left half is going to betray me at some point. Yeah. Because he only sleeps with one half of his brain at a time because he's a weirdo. <laughs> but um, He's been lobotomized. Yeah. He's, he's got that like severance thing going between his brain. So half of him sleeps at any given time. But nobody trusts anybody. And even the kleptomancer didn't trust himself to give away the plot of the kleptomancy and what the overall arching plan of it was so he tells her pretty much everything his entire plot line he's like yeah i'm going to tell you everything uh because the note said return you to the grand steward exactly as you were taken which means i'm going to erase your memory and that is how the first half of this book ends i feel like that falls into the category that you were talking about before where too much was revealed but in a way that kind of resolves that by saying the plan all along was to remove your memory. So it's who cares if you know. But that is also a huge supervillain mistake of like overexposing and overconfidence that everything is going to go exactly how you thought. Yeah, it was going. it's right. it's the like revealing the plot as the laser is getting like closer and closer to our hero that's strapped to the mm -hmm. the table. No, Mister Bond, I expect you to <laughs> die. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the hero has plenty of time to just like, okay, blah, 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 calculate, calculate. How do I get out of here? Another weird thing that he starts going on and on about before he tells her he's going to erase her memory is about Caverna itself, the city. And the way that he talks about it refers to the city as a woman. And he says a bunch of stuff. But along the lines, it's one of the first things that he says is she needs us. Without us, there is no her after all. She is the city, not the tunnels, though she does everything she can to keep us down here. And he thinks in his, in his mind that the reason why they even have true delicacies like the perfume and the cheese and the jelly that has like magical properties is to keep people down in the caverns. And I felt like that was one of the main things that tied into the book that we just previously read, Pure Nazy, where the main character sees the house that he's living in as almost like a god and that he is a child of the house and it will provide for him and I, there's a, quite a few things in this book in a face like glass that i feel like was kind of similar to piranesi yeah <laughs> i, I, I got that, that i got that instance as well like he he sees the city as an entity right and the entity has desires and the desires is to remain being an entity and he also explained that the caverns don't make sense because he talked to a cartographer for six minutes, went a little nuts, came back from being a little nuts and was like, I have a plan. That's how he became the kleptomancer. But he explains that the reason that cartographers go insane is because the tunnels don't actually make sense. They go the wrong directions. One tunnel should be going this direction but is intersected by another tunnel, but they don't ever actually intersect. And the city itself is growing to accommodate for more and more people. So that's why he thinks it's like a living, breathing entity. Another similarity that I saw was that this book capitalizes words that have a deeper meaning than how we use them in day-to-day -day life. So for instance, perfume, cheese, you know, the true delicacies in this book, all of the things that will cause some sort of reaction are capitalized. And in Piranesi, any sort of words that had to do with the house, like the halls and things like that, that you normally wouldn't capitalize in everyday language were capitalized. I think this entire thing is about mental illness and the degradation of the mind over time. Which is also yeah, another thing in Piranesi. We had people that had strokes. We had people <laughs> that are suffering, obviously, from like Alzheimer's and minds are just. They have, they basically have heart attacks when they see someone actually do emotion. Yeah. 
So do we want to talk very briefly about Madame Appeline and why we think that she might be connected to Neverfell? Neverfell has some, she feels that she has a connection to Madame Appeline. And then she remembers or realizes that they both have the same color eyes, have green eyes. And also she thinks back on when she got taken to the inquiry from Appeline's house that, you know, she remembered her saying impossible instead of like, you get this thing away from me. But and see, I, I read that when, when it was first happening and I was like, that's nothing. And then it, it felt like she's mulling it over in her head, making it more than what it is. And I, that's, that's why I think Madame Appeline's the one that tried to kill her. Yeah, so at one point, the crone ladies were talking about how uh, Madame Appeline had bought a dress for a little girl. And that little girl would have had to be like five or six years old. Coincidentally, the same age that um, Neverfell would have been. And nobody even realized that Madame Appeline had any children or had any connection to any children. So it was a little odd that she would make this purchase. Yeah, so that's why I don't think it's necessarily her mom. She might have a connection, but I don't think it's her mom, even though she wants to believe that Madame Appeline is her mom. I have a feeling it's a purchaser. I was going to say, with as many purchasing of... Yeah. I mean, she has changed hands multiple times in the course of a few days. I think it's pretty easy to buy and sell Children, a, anything, a children, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, any so, anything is a commodity here. So my guess, my my prediction is that Appeline is the one that's that is a villain, and she's going to try and kill, or has already tried to kill. Um, never fell. I think I agree that Madame Appeline is not the mother, but I think that she was helping somebody else try to escape. And that got thwarted somehow. And I think that that person that was trying to escape whatever that situation might have been from the overground is related to the person who was trying to make the faces with the cheese. Okay. My prediction, what I think is going on, is Madame Appeline is actually from the overground. She is Neverfell's mother. And she makes her way through life down there by pretending that she is a master of the faces. But she really can do all the faces. She's just very good at very selective ones that she's doing. Or at least have an explanation for her facial expressions. And so my prediction is that she will be reunited with Neverfell and they will be happily ever after as mother and daughter. Boo. Yep. <laughs> Along similar vein, uh, I found it odd that she was the one to discover like the sorrow. This is uh, Apollini. I've been <laughs> pronouncing it Apollini. Oh, okay. See, I have a prediction about that too. I think that the reason she knows how to do the sorrow faces is because she witnessed the mother's death. And okay. she okay. saw the child being taken away from either the mother or father. And that's how she knows how to make those faces because it's true tragedy of the dad dying and the mother being having her daughter taken away. And that's how she knows what the tragedy faces would be because she just studied them as they were dying because that's the kind of cold hearted people that live in this society. That makes or sense. she had hers taken. Do you think that she's the mom? I think she found herself some, uh, I think, Maybe she found a love over ground and had themselves a passionate weekend. And I don't know, somehow she ended up losing. A... She just she, kind of put the kid in the cheese tunnels. Yeah. Be like, you know, you I released you into the cheese tunnel I mean, wild. She is, she's a wild child. She lost her. And, uh, you know. I also kind of think that the father might be Maxim. I think the father might be the kleptomancer. Well, the reason that I think it might be Maxim is that she lost all of her memories before the before she wound up in the cheesemonger's place. And we know that Maxim's winery produces wine that removes memories. 
But we also yep. know that if it was removed with wine, you might have been able to get it back with wine. And also, to your point, the kleptomancer has a bunch of these wines. Like, where did he get all? Well, he's, a, he's a kleptomancer. So he got all the wines he <laughs> Wherever wanted. Wherever he wanted to. Yeah. Right. But yeah. he knows enough about wine of how to mix them. That's a good point, too. Okay. Yeah. If she wasn't able to get over that block, she needs a blend. She needs a specific one? Yeah. Mm. Maybe it's a blend that unlocks those memories. And here's the thing about the kleptomancer. He only has the drudge face, right? But he could have made himself forget all of the other faces except the drudge face. So he could be something completely different than what he's putting on. I haven't read her as a bad guy. I and mean, this is like putting a whole new spin on it. Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't think I see her as evil either. But I see everyone down here as evil. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess relatively speaking. I don't think she's conspiring against her. But you're right. I think the whole place should. I don't know if you've ever seen when they just cast an anthill. With, uh, yeah, like with an the steel that's or what aluminum. They, and that's definitely what they should do with this place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This this place very much reminds me of a, the like drow cities in D&D, where it's just like all evil and people are backstabbing each other all the time. Or like, you know, Game of Thrones, the whole world. It should just be burned to the ground. <laughs> yeah. Dragon fire. Yeah, dragon fire. Let it burn. Break the wheel. Pour gold over the entire world. Okay, well, this is where we're folding the page corner. Next time, we will finish up A Face Like Glass and talk about what's next on our bookshelf. Before we go, we wanted to ask you guys, what should our next double date night look like? Send your ideas to contact us at dogeardiscourse.com, on Facebook or Instagram at dogeardiscourse or dediscourse on Twitter, and... We will randomly pick one of the submissions and let you know on the last day of the month what we ended up doing. And of course, we'll give you a shout out if yours is the idea we picked completely at random. Thanks so much, and we will see you next time.